Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs, bestowing life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our speaker this evening is the great Professor Daniel Garland. Uh, as a PhD candidate in systematic theology at Ave Maria University, he earned his Master's in, the in Theology from Franciscan University at Steubenville and his BA in Theater from Florida State University. He has taught theology at Ave Maria University, Christendom College, and for the Permanent Diaconate Program of the Diocese of New Ulm, Minnesota. His articles have appeared in Homiletic and Pastoral Review, Maynooth Theological Journal, Haythrope Journal, The Angelicum, National Catholic Register. He is also the first English translator of St. Jerome's Commentary on the Prophet Haggai, which is published in the IVP, Academics Ancient Christian Text Series. It's wonderful to have Professor Garland back with us, who is a comrade in arms here at the Institute of Catholic Culture and is best known to all of you for his recent commentaries and wonderful gospel, Sunday gospel reflections, which we've been doing together. Uh, so it's a blessing to be able to continue this tonight. Welcome, Professor Daniel Garland. Thank you, Father. Thank you for everyone joining us tonight. Um, our talk tonight is on St. John of the Cross and his work, The Living Flame of Love. Uh, but before we get into the actual uh, text of the Living Flame, I want to first begin with uh, a brief introduction to the life of St. John of the Cross to set the context of the man and his work. So St. John of the Cross, and uh, I should say at the beginning, um, you know, I'm just a gringo, so if I butcher the Spanish words that I'll be saying tonight, uh, please forgive me, mea culpa. So uh, my, my first, first one is coming up. St. John of the Cross was born Juan de Yips, I hope I pronounced his last name correctly, uh, in Fontevero, Spain, which is northwest of Madrid on June 24th, 1542. To place this date in the context of history, uh, we should know that the Great Reform Council of the Church would convene three years later at Trent in 1545. St. John's father's family was a wealthy uh, silk merchant from Toledo. His mother, however, was a poor weaver. Now, because John's father married a woman below his class, he was disowned by his family. And so John grew up in a poor working class family. Shortly after John's birth, however, John's father died, leaving his mother to raise him and his two brothers all by herself. At the age of 14, in 1559, John attended the Jesuit College in Medina del Campo. There he studied the humanities, learning grammar, rhetoric, Greek, Latin, and theology. He finished his studies in 1563, the year of the closing of the Council of Trent, and entered the Carmelite Order at the Monastery of Santa Ana, also in Medina del Campo, and took the name of Juan de Santo Mattia, St. John, uh, John of St. Matthias. After he made his profession of vows, he went to study at the Carmelite College of San Andres, which was located in Salamanca. Here, he also studied at the great University of Salamanca, which for Spain was what Oxford was for England at that time and still is, and what the University of Paris was for France. The University of Salamanca was an exceptional school uh, where scholastic thought flourished and there was a revival of Thomistic thought. It is well known for the group of scholars known as the Salamanticenses, 
who were Carmelites who produced this massive volume, uh, massive commentary on the Summa Theologiae of St. Thomas Aquinas. It was here, no doubt, where John was steeped in the thought of the angelic doctor. John was ordained to the priesthood in 1567, and it was during this year when he returned back to Medina del Campo to celebrate his first mass in his hometown where he met St. Teresa of Avila for the first time. She was 52, he was 25. Teresa had already begun her reform in the Carmelite order, seeking to bring them back to the austerity uh, of their founding. Her reform movement became known as the Discalced Carmelites, as opposed to the Calced Carmelites. Now, calced means shod, which comes from the Latin word calcus, the, the word for shoe in Latin. Uh, and so you have discalced, which means the shoeless ones. So basically, uh, these were the hobbits of the religious order, right? The religious life. Um, but actually, back then, and as it is today, most discalced Carmelites didn't actually go around barefoot. It's it said that uh, St. John of the Cross himself did, even in the wintertime. Uh, but for most of them, instead of wearing shoes, they wore simple string uh, sandals, uh, rope sandals, which are a sign of poverty and reform. It was something to distinguish themselves from the Calcid Carmelites. Today, the Calcid Carmelites are known as the ancient observants, whereas the Discalced Carmelites today are known as the Theresian observants after St. Teresa of Avila. Teresa was in Medina del Campo to found a second house uh, of reform nuns. And she was also seeking at this point to extend the reform of the Carmelites to the friars. And so God's providence shined down upon these two great saints as John was feeling at this time that the Carmelite order wasn't exactly as, as strict as he had wanted it to be. Um, he was looking for something else. And so he was thinking of leaving the order and going off to join the Carthusians. Well, Teresa had other plans. She told him about a reform uh, to bring the Carmelites back to what is known as the primitive rule and that he could find what he was looking for here amongst the Carmelites. So St. John of the Cross decided to take her up on her offer and eventually Teresa was able to secure a small farmhouse which would become the first monastery of the Carmelite friars, the reform Carmelite friars. And it was on the first Sunday of Advent, November 28th, 1568, after John and the four other friars living with him renounced the mitigated rule, which is the rule that uh, by papal authority allowed all the laxities in and so forth. They renounced this rule and officially adopted the primitive rule. It was then that St. John, uh, that, that John of St. Matthias took on the new name of Juan de la Cruz, John of the Cross. Now, eventually in 1572, John moved to Avila to be the confessor for the convent of which Teresa was the prioress. John of the Cross, however, was not to live a peaceful life. Uh, it's often the case that when you're a leader of a reform movement within religious orders, that those who wish to live a life of comfort rather than the austerity of its founding, uh, they don't react too kindly to uh, upstarts who want to go back to the traditional charism. And this uh, we see in history, this is the case with the Cistercians as opposed to the Cluniac Benedictines. It was even the case for St. Francis in his own lifetime within his own order that he founded. It was no different for St. John of the Cross. In 1577, John was ordered by his provincial to return to Medina del Campo. And unfortunately, due to the circumstances of the time and the miscommunication, uh, the papal nuncio had, however, at the request of the nuns of Avila, ordered that John stay put in Avila. So John did. But the, uh, the Chalcid Carmelites who ordered him back, they saw this as an act of rebellion. And so he was taken prisoner and brought to Toledo where he was imprisoned in a small cell, really a closet, for more than nine months. He was ordered to repudiate the reform movement, which he never did, 
And for his reward, he was treated very poorly by the other friars, uh, being abused both verbally and physically. And it was during his imprisonment that he wrote his first poem, The Spiritual Canticle. Later on, uh, on August 16th, 1578, St. John of the Cross was able to escape his captors and hid with some of the Descalced nuns who were there in Toledo. In 1579, St. John founded and became the rector of a college for the Reformed Carmelites in the southern part of Spain. He spent almost 11 years as a professor and was known throughout Spain for his efforts in assisting the reform movement of the Descalced Carmelites. He was also in very high demand as a spiritual director. Now, at this time, during these uh, some 11 years, they were peaceful years for St. John of the Cross. But then in 1590, a new struggle destroyed that peace. This time, however, the clash wasn't between the Chalced Carmelites and the Discalced. It was amongst the Discalced Carmelites themselves. St. John found himself on the wrong side of the power struggle and was exiled to La Penula in Andalusa because of it. He soon succumbed to an illness and died on December 13, 1591. He was canonized by Benedict XIII in 1726 and declared the mystical doctor of the church by Pius XI in 1926. Now, you might be asking, what is mystical theology? Well, in short, it's the theology of Christian perfection that seeks to expound the contemplative union with God. In the words of St. John of the Cross, he says, mystical theology is known through love, and it is that which one not only knows, but at the same time experiences. In declaring St. John of the Cross a doctor of the church, Pius XI was set uh, was setting John up as an example of the true mystical theology over against the false mysticisms that had come before him and were prevalent during his time. Yet, unfortunately, in spite of Pius XI's intentions, there are some who want to co-opt uh, the doctrine of St. John of the Cross to affirm their new age Gnostic spirituality. And we see this in our age. You can search many websites uh, to just get a glimpse of what's out there on the theology of St. John of the Cross and the mystical theology. And you, you'll find some that, that talk about St. John of the Cross, and uh, they love St. John of the Cross, but they get him wrong. Uh, they, they think St. John of the Cross is in what I like to call the Oprah Winfrey spirituality. It's complete Gnostic nonsense. We, we must know and we must understand when we look at any of St. John of the Cross's writings, that St. John of the Cross is entirely orthodox in his theology. His teachers are the sacred scriptures, especially St. John the Evangelist and St. Paul, and his other great teacher is, as we already referred to, St. Thomas Aquinas. When Pius XI declared St. John of the Cross a doctor of the church, he proclaimed, Although they treat of difficult and profound matters, the ascent of Mount Carmel, the dark night of the soul, the living flame of love, and several other shorter works and letters written by him are nevertheless full of sound spiritual doctrine and are so well suited to the reader's understanding that they are rightly looked upon as a code and guide for the faithful soul endeavoring to embrace a more perfect life. The great philosopher Jacques Maritain described St. John of the Cross's doctrine in this way, quote, the doctrine of St. John of the Cross is the pure Catholic doctrine of the mystical life. We may well believe that if he has been proclaimed in our own days a doctor of the church, it is because like Thomas Aquinas, he meets a special need of the age. At the present day, naturalism has so ruined and subverted nature that there is no possible healing for nature itself, no possible return to the stable order of reason, save by a full and complete recognition of the rights of the supernatural, the absolute, the demands of the gospel and of the living faith. So we see that St. John of the Cross's writings are completely sound. If you read St. John of the Cross to uh, be saying that the soul 
has always existed in God. And it's an emanation out from God. And we are just little sparks of God that long to be back in union with God and absorbed up into the one. Well, let me suggest to you that you've got John of the Cross completely and totally wrong. That is not what he's saying. Now, I stress this because it's everywhere. Uh, I've seen so many people think this is what John of the Cross is saying. It is not what he's saying. His writings are completely sound. So that's a little uh, uh, caveat, a little uh, uh, introduction to the life of John of the Cross and a little warning there. Now let's turn to St. John of the Cross as a poet. St. John of the Cross composed his major works as poems. That's how they began. Um, now, he's not the first to do something like this, this genre of theological poetry. It goes back to the psalmist in the Old Testament. Uh, St. Ephraim the Syrian is another famous one. St. Thomas Aquinas wrote poems, his hymns to, uh, for Corpus Christi, the feast day, and so forth. But among these... St. John of the Cross stands among the best of them. Kieran Kavanagh, who is the definitive translator of the works of St. John of the Cross, states, in the field of Spanish literature, St. John of the Cross has won a prominent place, particularly for his poetry. As a poet, he is ranked among the greatest in the history of Spain. Such eminent critics as Menendez Palayo and Damaso Alonso have confessed to a religious terror they felt before the beauty and the burning passion of his verses. So you might ask, why poetry? Why not simply write in prose to describe the mystical experiences he wishes to convey? Well, the answer is because only poetical language is fitting to describe the union which the soul experiences with God in the highest state of perfection. And even then, it fails. St. John of the Cross states as much in his prologue uh, to The Living Flame. He says, knowing the reader understands that everything I say is as far from reality as is a painter from the living object represented, uh, represented I, shall venture to de I shall venture to declare what I know. Right? So St. John of the Cross is aware that when we say that through grace, the soul is united in a relationship of bride to bridegroom, that this relationship elevates, heals, and perfects the soul. He knows that when we say this, we can understand it intellectually, but the reality of what is going on is indescribable. And this is the nature of poetry, right? To attempt to describe through allegory, through simile, through metaphor, that which cannot be described. But poetry, however, allows us to come as close as possible with our finite language that we can to describe the glorious encounter that St. John wishes to describe. But here you might be thinking, well, isn't poetry written in such a way that it's open to many different interpretations? Maybe when I read a poetical work, I get something out of it uh, that you won't, and you'll get something out, out of it that I won't. So if he's writing in poems to describe this, this deep spiritual doctrine, how will we ever know what St. John of the Cross is really talking about? Right? And that's a great question. It's a very good question. It's a question that if you did not have, you should, because it's the very question that those in the time of St. John of the Cross had themselves. And so um, they were asking, what, what does this poem mean? What are, you, what are you attempting to describe by writing this? And so many of them asked St. John of the Cross to give an explanation of these poetical verses. And he does, and that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. Otherwise, trying to translate what's going on there, what he's, what he's seeking to convey would be near impossible, unless you've experienced it yourself. Now, the bad thing is that sometimes St. John of the Cross's commentary is as enigmatic as his poetry. So we have to do our best. Now, the poem that we're looking at tonight, The Living Flame of Love, was written sometime between 1582 and 1585. The commentary on the poem, which comes later, 
was written at the request of Doña Ana de Peñalosa, a wealthy widow and benefactress of the Carmelites. Uh, and the commentary went through two different redactions. The first was in 1585, somewhere between 1585 and 1587. And then later on, uh, scholars aren't really sure, somewhere between 1586 and the end of his life in 1591. All right, so that's enough for introduction. Let's get to the meat. Let's look at the poem itself. So here we are, the living flame of love. And uh, the heading there is St. John of the Cross's own heading. Stanzas which the soul recites in the intimate union with God, its beloved bridegroom. O oh, living flame of love, that tenderly wounds my soul in its deepest center. Since now you are not oppressive, now consummate, if it be your will. Tear through the veil of this sweet encounter. O oh, sweet cautery, O oh, delightful wound, O oh, gentle hand, O oh, delicate touch, that tastes of eternal life and pays every debt. In killing, you change death to life. O oh, lamps of fire, in whose splendors the deep caverns of feeling, once obscure and blind, now give forth so rarely, so exquisitely, both warmth and light to their beloved. How gently and lovingly you wake in my heart, where in secret you dwell alone, and in your sweet breathing, filled with good and glory, how tenderly you swell my heart with love. That's it. Four, four stanzas. That's all we have. But in these four stanzas is contained the wisdom of spiritual perfection. All right, so let's, let's examine this a little bit more. When, what St. John of the Cross is describing here in this poem is the highest state of the spiritual perfection that can be found in this life. In the spiritual stage, there are three, in the spiritual life, there are three stages the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive. The purgative stage uh, is the stage wherein the soul is purged through mortifications and suffering so as to rid itself of all attachments to this life. And this is what I spoke about previously in my last webinar uh, Come, let us die to him. Uh, dying to self and living for Christ. You can check that out if you're interested. The illuminative stage is where the soul is continually growing closer to God. The intellect is more and more uh, illumined, attuned to spiritual things. The person is practicing the cardinal virtues consistently. The soul in this state easily avoids mortal sins, but yet there are still trials. There, there are periods of dryness and even uh, periods of darkness. The goal is during this stage, as someone once said, quote, to seek the God of consolation, not the consolations of God. The next stage, the final stage, the height of the spiritual life is the unitive stage. And this is the stage that is described here in The Living Flame of Love. So let's now turn to the poem and, and begin to grasp what St. John of the Cross is describing. In the first stanza, it begins, O living flame of love. Now, the living flame of love, right at the beginning, is the Holy Spirit. Here, St. John of the Cross is drawing on the rich biblical imagery of Pentecost, where uh, the Holy Spirit descends upon the apostles in the upper room, uh, as told in the Acts of the Apostles, as tongues of fire. And this is a very Trinitarian image. Remember, St. John of the Cross is operating within the framework of Catholic tradition. The Holy Spirit then is the love between the Father and the Son. And the Holy Spirit, who is love, is poured into the soul of the Christian through grace, allowing him to participate in the divine life of God. St. John of the Cross describes it. He says, this flame of love is the spirit of its bridegroom, who is the Holy Spirit. The soul feels him within itself, not only as a fire that has consumed and transformed it, but as a fire that burns and flares within it, as I mentioned. And that flame, every time it flares up, bathes the soul in glory and refreshes it with the quality of divine life. 
So we see that the, the, the soul is transformed by love, by the love that is the Holy Spirit itself. And this transformation, we have to keep in mind, is by participation. The soul does not become God. The transformation that takes place by grace, grace being a foretaste of glory, does not destroy nature. There is a participation in the divine nature that is brought about, but the soul is still a human soul. The nature remains human. But, as we said, it is elevated, it is healed, it is perfected in its humanity, so that the soul possess, possesses by participation the same goods that the son possesses by nature. As the great Thomas Reginald Garagou Lagrange, uh, who taught at the Angelicum in Rome and who directed Pope St. John Paul II's dissertation on St. John of the Cross, uh, he states, although this union is never a transformation that absorbs the soul into God, as some false mystics have pretended, it is true, however, that the soul feels God in its most intimate recesses. In a certain sense, God is more intimate to the soul than the soul is itself, uh, than the soul itself, inasmuch as he, God, is the interior principle of the whole inner life. This union, which brings the gifts of the Holy Spirit, urges from within the accomplishment of acts that the soul by itself could not accomplish. So we see that the Holy Spirit in the state, in the state, the state of union with God, as the next verse goes, tenderly wounds the soul in its deepest center, in the very heart of the soul. Now here we have an interesting paradox that's portrayed. The soul is wounded. It's assailed. But as St. John of the Cross states, it is assailed gently in powerful love with a glimpse of the glory of eternal life. That's what it's assailed with. It's assailed, it's given this glimpse of what uh, it's like to be with God in the next life. And this intense feeling causes the soul to exclaim, since now you are not oppressive, as you were at the beginning of the spiritual life in the purgative stage. Now, uh, we can turn to scripture here that this is uh, something that St. John of the Cross is borrowing from the Gospel of John. Uh, if you have your Bible, take out your Bible and turn to John 16. John 16, verse 7. John 16, verse 7. This is in the context of the farewell discourse where Jesus is preparing his apostles uh, for his uh, departure on the cross and then uh, his future ascension. John 16, uh, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the counselor, that is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convince the world, convince or convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Of judgment. Because the ruler of this world is judged. So the role of the Holy Spirit in that purgative stage, when it's oppressive to the soul, it convicts the soul of sin and the attachments to this world. But in this state of the living flame of love, the soul has gone beyond that. Since the Holy Spirit is now not oppressive, the soul can cry out because the Holy Spirit is sweet to him. It can say, now consummate, if it be your will. That is, bring about the fullness of the union of spiritual marriage. Let the soul partake without interruption of this cont contemplation of the beatific vision. There is such a longing expressed in these words. It stems from the fact that the union that is found in the heights of contemplation of the Blessed Trinity is not a permanent union in this life. Only in heaven, when we experience the beatific vision, is the contemplation of God permanent. But in this life, there's glimpses. And so the soul, as St. John expresses, longs to go back. He longs to have these, these glimpses again. But the soul who has reached this unitive stage in the spiritual life can't help longing for this permanence. So the soul cries out, tear through the veil of this sweet encounter. 
Now the veil is the veil between this life and the next. It's the only thing standing in the way of the union that the saints in heaven experience. The soul earnestly longs for the perfect union with God that can only be had in the next. So in this stage, as St. John describes, the soul has reached the heights of union attainable in this life. And for the soul described in the living flame of love, it is a very thin veil that separates it. It is a veil of the sheerest substance. In the poetry of St. John of the Cross, you can feel the intense desire, almost exasperation of the soul, reaching out, knowing that it just has this, this, this little bit to go, and then it can be with its bridegroom. It's as if the soul is saying, if I could only just burst through and be with my creator, my beloved, and partake of the end for which my soul was created, the beatific vision, and to see the bridegroom as he is. St. John of the Cross states, since, the soul, since this soul is so close to God, that it is transformed into a flame of love in which the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are communicated to it, how can it be thought incredible that it enjoy a foretaste of eternal life? <clears throat> Yet it does not enjoy eternal life perfectly, since the conditions of this life do not allow it. But the delight that the flaring of the Holy Spirit generates in the soul is so sublime that it makes it known that which savors of eternal life. Thus it refers to this flame as living, not because the flame is not always living, but because of this effect, it makes the soul live in God spiritually and experience the life of God in the manner that David mentions, my heart and my flesh rejoiced in the living God. So we see that the Holy Spirit then is not only uh, living, it's not a, only a living flame, but it's a life-giving flame. The flame of the Holy Spirit creates a desire within the soul to will what God wills. So St. John of the Cross says that in this state, the souls, quote, will and appetite are so united with God that it considers the fulfillment of God's will to be its glory. Now, St. John of the Cross here states that there are two things that the soul wills in this state of perfection. It asks two requests of the bridegroom, adveniat regnum tuum and fiat voluntas tua. These are the two, uh, two of the petitions Christ taught us to pray in Matthew 6. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. St. John again explains, what you desire me to ask for, I ask for. And what you do not desire, I do not desire, nor can I, nor does it even enter my mind to desire it. My petitions are now more valuable and estimable in your sight, since they come from you, and you move me to make them. And I make them in the, de in the delight and joy of the Holy Spirit, my judgment now issuing from your countenance. That is, when you esteem and hear my prayer, tear then this thin veil of this life and do not let old age cut it naturally that from now on i may love you with the plenitude and fullness my soul desires forever and ever that is a deep love and union which uh union with god which is described here think about it when we pray to the our father when we say thy kingdom come thy will be done do we mean it I mean, do we really mean it? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Do we want the veil to be lifted for Christ at that very moment that we pray this, to come on the clouds of heaven, coming down in all his glory in the culmination of time? I dare say that most of us don't mean that when we say it. Most of us don't want that. We say, well, I have to, you know, I have to do this first. I have to achieve this goal in my life first. I have to, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'll be ready to be uh, prepared to meet God, right? But the soul in the unitive stage means it. The soul in this height of perfection says, don't let me die a natural death. 
as an old man. Take me now. Let me have this union that I have had glimpses of. It shall come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha. This is the view that we too should have in this life. Right now, we, we don't necessarily have to long for the end of all time, but we should long for the end of our time, right? Are we prepared to die today? Are we prepared? Are we free of all the attachments of this world? Once again, the soul in the state of union is. And that's the goal. This is the goal of the Christian life. This is the goal of the spiritual life that we must have. We must have such a detachment to the world that we could say right now, I'm not attached to anything. Take me, God, now. I don't need whatever uh, I'm trying to get in the future. I don't need to get this height of fame, publicity. I don't need this wealth or anything. All I want, Lord, is you. Right? Do we have that? Now, I can't say that I myself am at that level right now. But that's the goal. That's what we should strive for, always. Keep striving. Right? Now let's turn to the second stanza. In this stanza, we see again the Trinitarian dimensions of St. John's teaching. The verse, O oh, sweet cautery, O oh, delightful wound, refers to the Holy Spirit. And it's a striking image, too. Uh, for those who don't know what a cautery is, uh, it's the practice of burning a wound to close it up or burning off some excess of growth with fire, right? Uh, the Holy Spirit, then, is not as, as a natural cautery, which hurts and causes pain. It's a sweet and delightful cautery. As St. John of the Cross explains, there is a difference between this loving cautery and the cautery produced by material fire. The wound left by material fire is only curable by other medicines, whereas the wound affected by the cautery of love is incurable through medicine. For the very cautery that causes it cures it, and by curing it causes it. As often as the cautery of love touches the wound of love, it causes a deeper wound of love. And thus, the more it wounds, the more it cures and heals. The more wounded the lover, the healthier the lover is. And the cure caused by love is to wound and inflict wound upon wound to such an extent that the entire soul is dissolved into a wound of love. And now all cauterized and made one wound of love, it is completely healthy in love, for it is transformed in love. So even in this prose, St. John of the Cross is a poet. Right. But do you see what he's saying? Do you, do you grasp what he's saying? The Holy Spirit burns away all the dross and imperfections of this life. Sure, it hurts at first. Right. This is the oppression that he talked about in the first verse. But when we reach this stage, when we pass through the purgative, through the illuminative, when we come through the unitive stage, the more it burns, wounds the soul, the more the soul becomes like the Holy Spirit until it is transformed into love. But again, remember that this is not an expression of the soul becoming God. St. John of the Cross cautions, he says, quote, the fire does not consume and destroy the soul in which it so burns. The soul remains human, but elevated and transformed to love God as God loves. The next, O oh, gentle hand. The gentle hand is the Father. St. John of the Cross says that we should understand that since it is as generous and bountiful as it is rich, it gives, when open to favor the soul, rich and powerful presents. So what are these rich and powerful presents? Well, it's the greatest present, the greatest gift of all. It's God himself pouring himself forth to the soul. The gift is a gift, as St. John says, by which all debts are fully paid. And we'll talk more about that in just a second. The next verse, O oh, delicate touch that tastes of eternal life. This, St. John said, is the word, the Son of God. St. John of the Cross tells us that when the word of God makes contact with our soul, it is such a delicate, loving touch that it gives us a taste of eternal life. And it's very fitting. That, it's, that this is appropriated to the word of God, the Son, 
since it was the work of the Son, doing the work of the Father, dying on the cross, purchasing for us eternal life, which is made uh, present to us through the sacrament of baptism. Here, St. John of the Cross pauses in his commentary, and he professes his inability to express the full reality of the experience. He says the delicateness of delight felt in this contact, this contact of the Son, giving us this taste of eternal life. This contact is inexpressible. I would desire not to speak of it so as to avoid giving the impression that it is no more than what I describe. There is no way to catch in words the sublime things of God that take place in these souls. The appropriate language for the persons receiving these favors is that they understand them, experience them within themselves, enjoy them, and be silent. One is conscious in this state that these things are in a certain way like the white pebble that St. John said would be given to the one who conquers, and on that pebble a new name written, which no one knows but the one who receives it, Revelation 2.17. So what is this taste of eternal life? Well, it's inexpressible. But one thing is sure, those who have tasted it know it. So then we go on. The cautery then is the Holy Spirit, the hand is the Father, and the touch is the Son. The whole Trinity affects the divine work of moving the soul to union with itself. But as St. John says, quote, although it names the three according to the properties of their effects, it speaks only to one, saying, you, singular, change death to life because all of them work together, and accordingly it, it attributes everything to one and everything to all. Now, what St. John of the Cross is speaking of here is that within the inner Trinitarian life, there is a distinction of persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. However, in the work of the Trinity ad extra, outside of the inner life, uh, all the three persons act as one. So there's a unity of action outside of the Trinity, uh, outside of the inner life of the Trinity. Now, back to the debts. What are these debts that are paid off? St. John tells us that they are the merits gained through redemptive suffering in the previous stages of the spiritual life. Right? So God will not let the sufferings it takes to get to the stage go unmerited. He will pay those debts that are that these merits that are accumulated up, that are meritorious for eternal life. In the last line of the stanza, he says, In killing you change death to life. What is meant by this verse is that by killing the deeds of the flesh, the soul acknowledges that God has brought it to new life and so to union with the Blessed Trinity. St. John writes, finally, all the movements, operations, and inclinations the soul had previously from the principle and strength of its natural life are now in this union dead to what they formerly were, changed into divine movements and alive to God. Accordingly, the intellect of this soul is God's intellect. Its will is God's will. Its memory is the memory of God, and its delight is God's delight. And although the substance of the soul is not the substance of God, once again, he's a good Thomist, since it cannot undergo a substantial conversion into him, it has now become God through participation in God, being united to and absorbed in him as it is in the state. Such a union is wrought in this perfect state of the spiritual life, yet not as perfectly as in the next life. Consequently, the soul is dead to all it was in itself, which was death to it, and alive to what God is in himself. So once again, Thomas is a good Thomas. The soul does not undergo a substantial conversion into God, but participates in the life and the actions of God so that the soul's willing is God's willing. The soul's loving and knowledge is God's loving and knowledge. Right? There's no hint of a false mysticism here. Notice also that the soul says you, you talking to God, you changed my life. From You changed 
from death to life. It is the grace that God brings about. It is, it is by grace that God brings about this new life, right? It's not Pelagianism in the least bit. Right? We can do nothing on our own. It's only by the, uh, by the Holy Spirit, the whole Trinity dwelling within us that we are able to be brought to this. Right? We have to open ourselves up and cooperate with the grace that God wants to give us. And so it's God working through us and with us. Right? So the, uh, we can get into a little bit of uh, metaphysics here, some philosophy. What is being described is known as uh, two types of causality. There's, there's primary or efficient causality, that would be God, and then there's instrumental causality. And so an instrumental cause, which is us cooperating with God, the way an instrumental cause works is that it works according to its nature, but moved by the efficient cause. And so it's move, the efficient cause moves the instrumental cause in the way in which is proper to its nature. And so the grace of God is working in us to cooperate with him, moving us so that it's God moving us to this state of perfection. Now, before we move to the next stanza, there is one more thing to mention. And uh, St. John of the Cross brings this out. It's in this highest state of the spiritual life that the soul, as St. John says, the soul always walks in festivity, inwardly and outwardly. And it frequently bears on its spiritual tongue a new song of great jubilation in God, a song always new and folded in a gladness and love arising from the knowledge the soul has of its happy state. Now, we can think here of the joy uh, that was expressed by St. Teresa of Calcutta. Even in the midst of the darkest sorrow, even later on in her life, as she tells in her autobiography, when she went through the dark night of the soul, when you look at her, you see the joy that exudes, that radiates from being a child of God. This is the joy that the soul in this highest perfection has. And I dare say, we don't have to wait to get to this state of perfection to have this joy. This is a joy that we should always have. A joy with the knowledge that we are redeemed as children of God. We are sons, heirs of Christ. We are sons with Christ, heirs of the Father, and so we will receive the inheritance. Now, this kind of joy, this kind of happiness that the Christian experiences is not some sort of uh, false Pollyannish, uh, you know, uh, just this joy that is, is oblivious to all that's going around, uh, around it. It takes into account uh, the, the craziness of this world, and there's much craziness in this world. But as a Christian, we must have the joy that, that brings others to Christ, that people see us and they see the joy we have. And they say, I want that, right? It's the joy of St. Philip Neri, right? He was known as, as almost a clown, uh, uh, the, the saintly clown. He loved being a child of God. And that's the joy we have to have. We shouldn't wait to the perfect stage of the spiritual life. We need to have that joy now, right? We need to rejoice as if we're already there. All right, moving to the third stanza. Here he says, O oh, lamps of fire. And here we get this succession of O's, right? Um, poem with, uh, oh, we just came off, O oh, sweet cautery, O oh, delightful wound, O oh, gentle hand, and now O oh, lamps of fire, right? This O oh, is an expression of joy that St. John of the Cross is speaking about. The lamps that he describes here are the different attributes of God that the soul in union with God experiences. So the soul then is illumined to see God as God sees himself. The soul sees the wisdom, the beauty, the goodness, the omnipotence, the mercy, etc., that God uh, of God and experiences each one individually. But even though the soul experiences each of these attributes individually, these attributes are not separate things from God. All attributes are one in God. And are God, 
right? This is because God's existence is his essence, right? God is the only necessary creature. We are, our, our essence is not our existence. We're finite, contingent creatures. If, if it were the case that our essence was our existence, we would be God, right? But only God is necessary. And so the soul in experiencing the attributes of God doesn't experience them as something outside of God, right? But experiences them as God himself, but under different aspects communicated and accommodated to our human capacity. He goes on, in whose splendors, the splendors here are the loving knowledge of God that the attributes of God communicates to the souls. And he goes, uh, continues, the deep caverns of feeling, right? The deep caverns are the faculties of the soul, the memory, the intellect, and the will, which once were obscure and blind. So what he's getting at here is the faculties of the soul used to be obscured and blind because of its attachment to worldly things. Now, being filled with God, right, uh, in, this, in this obscurity and blindness, it's not filled with God, which means that whenever God's not in us, whenever we're not filled with God, we're going to have something else in there to replace it, right? And it's not going to be good, right? These other things, they can't satisfy us. As St. Augustine says, our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in you. But St. John of the Cross takes it even further. He says that the faculties of the soul do not even know the extent of their emptiness until God begins to fill them. He says, it is noteworthy that when these caverns of the faculties are not emptied, purged and cleansed of every affection for creatures, they do not feel the vast emptiness of their deep capacity. Any little thing that adheres to them in this life is sufficient so, uh, to so burden and bewitch them that they do not perceive the harm or note the lack of their immense goods or know their own capacity. Right? Think of those who don't know God. Think of all the stuff that their soul is filling up with, demonic stuff, otherworldly stuff that's driving them in, greed, uh, wealth, power, hungry, lust, all that. Right? The soul, the Christian needs to know that it has to open itself, rid itself of all these things and open itself to God so that God can fill himself with himself. Right. When they're filled, when the soul is filled with the presence of the Blessed Trinity, then the next verse, they give forth so rarely, so exquisitely, both warmth and light to their beloved. Here, here is where I think that St. John of the Cross reaches the apex of his theological genius. When God has given himself totally to the soul uh, that opens itself, opens itself up wholly to God. What could the soul possibly give in return to God? Right? It's the perennial question. What do you give a guy who has everything? Right? What can an, a, a finite person give to the finite God? In this state, the soul has nothing to give God. Nothing but God himself. The warmth and light then that he speaks about, that the soul gives to the beloved, is the beloved. Listen to the mystical doctor himself. He says, and this is a, a bit lengthy quote, but uh, there's so much good in it. He says, the soul is conscious here that God is indeed its own and that it possesses him by inheritance with the right of ownership as his adopted child through the grace of his gift of himself. Having for its own, it can give him and communicate him to whomever it wishes. Thus it gives him to its beloved, who is the very God who gave himself to it. By this donation, it repays God for all it owes him, since it willingly gives as much as it receives from him. Because the soul in this gift to God offers him the Holy Spirit, with voluntary surrender as something of its own, so that God loves himself in the Holy Spirit as he deserves, it enjoys inestimable delight and fruition, seeing that it gives God something of its own that is suited to him according to his infinite being. 
It is true that the soul cannot give God again to himself, since in himself he is ever himself. Nevertheless, it does this truly and perfectly, giving all that was given it by him in order to repay love, which is to give as much as is given. And God, who could not be considered paid with anything less, is considered paid with that gift of the soul, and he accepts it gratefully as something it gives him of its own. In this very gift, he loves it anew. And in this re-surrender of God to the soul, the soul also loves as though again. Right, so here we see the soul in realizing that it has nothing of its own to give. That any natural gift is wholly, infinitely unworthy and unsuitable to the infinite God. Here the soul rejoices at being able to give God back to God. St. John says, this is the soul's deepest satisfaction and happiness, to see that it gives God more than it is worth itself, the very divine light and divine heat that are given to it. And then the fourth stanza. Here the soul is addressing its bridegroom with deep love, esteeming him and thanking him for two effects, St. John says, two effects brought about by this union of the soul with God. Now, in this last stanza, the commentary in this last stanza, St. John of the Cross has the least to say. It's as if the first three stanzas uh, themselves are the path on to the, the heights of the spiritual life. And when he gets to this fourth stanza, he can't describe it. He's reached the heights, and the only thing left to say is that he can't say anything, right? What John of the Cross gets into here is uh, known as the apophatic way of Dionysius the Areopagite, which states that when it comes to God, all that we can know is that we don't know, right? So in describing these two effects, the first effect is the awakening of God in the soul. Uh, the verses that correspond to this, how gently and lovingly you wake in my heart where in secret you dwell alone. And then the second effect, the breathing of the Holy Spirit within the soul and the verses corresponding and in your sweet breathing filled with good and glory, how tenderly you swell my heart with love. For the awakening, St. John says that here the soul knows creatures through God and not God through the creatures, right? It's the reverse. Normally, the, the, the normal way uh, outside of the revelation of God is that we know God through the created order. But here uh, you have the reverse of it. In this height of union, you know creatures through God, right? In other words, the soul knows with the knowledge of God. Now, not everything, of course, but uh, the creature is still finite, but as much as it can know in this life, it has a glimpse of God's knowledge and what God knows. St. John says in describing this, he says, what a person knows and experiences of God, uh, he's describing here the first effect. He says, what a person knows and experiences of God in this awakening is entirely beyond words. Since this awakening is the communication of God's excellence to the substance of the soul, which is its heart referred to in the verse, an immense powerful voice sounds in it, the voice of a multitude of excellence, of thousands of virtues in God, infinite in number. And he doesn't describe what that is, right? He can't, right? What does it feel like to, to see as God sees, to know as God sees? Only when we experience it. When we're in heaven in the next life, will we be able to uh, get a glimpse of it? Well, we can get a glimpse in this life in, in, a, in a finite way, right? Uh, but we'll see it as it is in the next life. And then for the breathing of the Holy Spirit, St. John of the Cross concludes his commentary on uh, the living flame of love with this. He says, I do not desire to speak of the spiration, filled for the soul with good and glory and delicate love of God. For I am aware of being incapable of doing so. And if I were to try it, it might seem less than it is. 
It is a spiration that God produces in the soul, in which by that awakening of lofty knowledge of the Godhead, he breathes the Holy Spirit in it in the same proportion as its knowledge and understanding of him, absorbing it most profoundly in the Holy Spirit, rousing its love with a divine exquisite quality and delicacy according to what it beholds in him. Since the breathing is filled with good and glory, the Holy Spirit, through this breathing, filled the soul with good and glory and which he enkindled in it love of himself, indescribably and incomprehensibly in the depths of God, to whom be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, in conclusion, uh, we can say that we've seen here in the living flame of love, uh, as we said before, the height of of the perfection in the spiritual life. That is attainable in this life. Now, at this point, there might be objections, right? There might be people who say, well, why do we just study this? Isn't this all a pipe dream? Isn't this just for uh, religious and monks somewhere off hold in in a monastery, right? The answer is no, we're all called to holiness. We're all called to reach the heights of perfection. And we do it in this life or in the next, right? One point, we have to do it. And so we're all called to spiritual, spiritual perfection, not just monks and nuns in cloisters. And so in conclusion, I close with uh, the words of Reginald Garagul Lagrange. It would certainly be too sublime for us if we had not received in baptism that life of grace, which in us too must develop into eternal life. If we had not often received Holy Communion, the, per, the precise effect of which is to increase that grace within us. Let us remind ourselves that each of our communions ought to be substantially more fervent than the preceding, since each of them ought to increase the love of God in us and thus dispose us to receive our Lord with a greater fervor of will on the following day. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Garland. We have a, two questions that are very similar. Um, I'll take the, the second from Mary Revlo. Um, once attained to this level, would a saint keep it through the remainder of, of life? Uh, was that true for John of the Cross? Uh, can you help us understand this? Well, Lisa asks a very similar question. If someone has experienced the unitive state briefly, what stage follows? And is it common for one to experience this union uh, then to, to enter into a time of darkness or feeling that God has abandoned them or even experience a falling back into previous sins? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, first we have to clarify uh, what we mean by darkness, right? So, um, if we mean darkness as falling back into sins, no. If we mean darkness as feeling an absence of God, right, uh, the dark night of the soul, then then yes, you can. In in, in this state, there's um, there's stages that come from the illuminative into the unitive, and even within the unitive, there's these experiences. Of, of an absence of God's presence, right? And uh, this is famous in our, our age with uh, the story of St. Teresa of Calcutta, who described for so long she was in this dark night of the soul, this absence uh, of consolation that God is there. But she kept the faith. She knew God was there. She couldn't feel him, uh, but she knew he was there. Right? And, and still desired and still increased in that love. And so these... these uh, darknesses, these dark nights, as St. John himself calls them, are, are ways for the soul to, um, to, to see that it needs absolute dependence upon God, right? Um, so can you fall back? Once you've reached this height, can you fall away? No. This is, you've, you've gone through the, uh, purgative stage. You stripped off whatever uh, attachments to this world, whatever mortal sin, attachment to mortal sin. And then you go to the illuminative stage. And, and there, uh, you, you don't commit mortal sin, but venial sins uh, are still a temptation, right? There's, there's still this attachment. But once you reach the unitive stage, uh, you're, you're, you're not 
in you're fully imbued with the grace of God. And so your soul longs for what God longs for. Your soul wills what God wills. And so sin and grace. Now, now, um, absolutely. Could you fall away? Right. Could, is, is it necessary, uh, 100% simply that you'll, uh, not sin? No, there's always the possibility, but the soul is in such a state in this unit of stage that it, it won't sin. It's, it's complete, you completely united to God, uh, in the highest stage possible in this life. And, and right. Once you see God, once you have this glimpse, this vision of God, how could you go back? How could you go back to uh, the attachments of this world which lead to sin, right? Uh, your, your whole thought, your whole mind is focused on God in this longing, as he says, to tear this veil and get to the other side, to end the life and be with God. So you, you wouldn't want to go back down and, and, and like, Go back to the bottom of the rung of the ladder in the spiritual life. Um, you know, when St. Thomas Aquinas, towards the end of his life, right, he, he's writing about God. He's, he's progressing through the stages of perfection. And then he, this, this famous vision he has at the end of his life, he sees the vision of God. And his, uh, his, uh, uh, his apprentice, his, his uh, uh, student, Reginald of Perperno, comes in. And uh, Thomas says to him, I can't write anymore. I'm done. I, from what I've seen, everything else, all my works, all my writing about God is, is straw compared to what I've seen, right? Your, your grasp, the intellect, the will, the whole soul is grasped by this vision of God that you want nothing more. Right. So falling away would be, uh, I have never heard of any, anyone who legitimately has this uh, experience to, to have fallen away. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Can you just help let us know uh, a question coming in, whether uh, the Living Planet of Love was written in Spanish or in Latin? It was written in Spanish. Okay. Yes. Um, do you have any follow-up reading? Teresa Cotter is asking if there's a book or something to follow up to kind of <laughs> the presentation, but uh, would like to, <laughs> this is like an invitation for her. She wants more. I do. If you look at the last page at the bottom of your handout, um, I have uh, suggested further reading there. There's, um, I have these with me. The Collected Works of St. John of the Cross. This is an old copy. This is kind of the definitive translation here uh, by Kieran Kavanaugh. Uh, there is this great, uh, the dissertation, you can't see this here, um, reveal my secret that I'm on stage. Uh, the dissertation of Pope St. John Paul II, Faith According to St. John of the Cross. Uh, it's published by uh, Whiff and Stock. Whiff and Stock there. Um, this dissertation by John Paul II, as I said, was uh, directed by Reginald Garagou Lagrange uh, at the Angelicum. And then there is Reginald Garagou Lagrange himself, Knowing the Love of God, Lessons from a Spiritual Master. And finally, uh, another great one, uh, the late Father Thomas Dubé, The Fire Within, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, and the Gospel on Prayer. Thank you very much, Professor Garland. Excellent, excellent presentation. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.